Congressman, good to have you here. This is a very serious topic. I mean, you are calling out members of your own party. Can you explain your frustration? Well, Stephanie, this is deeply, deeply personal. Uh, I'm 52 years old, and this is the first time in my entire life I have felt compelled to speak up, to stand up, uh, and do it as loudly as possible. You know, I don't have the platform that some of my progressive colleagues do on social media. Uh, and I'm asking for some empathy, some compassion, and the recognition uh, that this is real. And Stephanie, I promised my great-grandparents uh, when I listened to their stories about the pogroms that they escaped in Eastern Europe, about the Holocaust, about my hometown, Minneapolis, being the most anti-Semitic city in the entire nation in the 1940s. You know, we're accustomed to swastikas uh, painted on synagogues and our cemeteries defaced. But when I see violence in the streets, I see Jewish people being attacked for simply being Jewish in our country, in the United States of America, darn right, I'm going to speak up and ask with compassion and vigor uh, that my colleagues speak up. And I want to say this, too. What I'm seeing on the right, Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about Nazis every other day. Uh, I saw the Confederate flags and the Hitler shirts in the United States Capitol on January 6th when we were attacked with the insurrection. We've got a crisis of compassion and empathy in our country, uh, and I'm going to do everything that I can uh, to bring attention to it and implore that my fellow countrymen and women do something. How frustrating is it, right? You said just moments ago you don't have as big of a platform as some of the more extreme members of either party, really. Um, how frustrating is it for you that headlines looking for, you know, compassion and care don't get as much attention as the full-blown crazy. Well, Stephanie, I think we have to have a national discussion about just that. And I'm concerned about extremism wherever it comes from, any side of the aisle or political perspective. You know, it doesn't trouble me that my colleagues have bigger platforms. They've earned that. I'm not going to condemn them for that. But I ask that they use those platforms uh, to bring us together, uh, to, to point out where we can be more compassionate to one another. I'm not trying to dissuade them from speaking their truth with authenticity, and they have a lot of good to share. Uh, but I'm asking for a little bit of recognition, too, that during a time in our nation's history when so many minority communities are under attack, that we unify rather than further divide. Uh, and that's my mission, and I'm asking anybody uh, who has those platforms to take a breath uh, and recognize how important this is to a community that has long found a home in the Democratic Party, mind you, since Truman, uh, Hubert Humphrey, a dear friend of the Jewish community. Uh, but the Jewish community in this country is feeling awfully uncomfortable right now for reasons that many can imagine based on just the litany of attacks that you just referenced on your show. But what you're saying is pretty serious. I mean, you are putting colleagues of yours in the hot seat, basically saying, how come some progressive members are quick to criticize Israel and slow to show concern about anti-Semitism? I mean, I mean, those are serious accusations. Have they have you gotten any response? Sure. You can imagine the response I've gotten uh, a lot of it positive. I've gotten a lot of condemnation, which, uh, frankly, validates my whole point. Now, I want to refer to Richie Torres, a wonderful new member of Congress, a progressive, a gay man from New York City who has a great fondness for Israel uh, because he recognizes it is the most progressive nation in the Middle East. He knows that only in Israel can a gay man not just survive but thrive. Only in Israel is the entire population afforded rights, including Arabs. In fact, Arabs have more rights in Israel, Arab citizens of Israel, than they do in Arab countries in the Middle East, for goodness sakes. You know, these are truths. Women's rights are protected. And look at the Netanyahu government has plenty that I disagree with, uh, in fact, quite distinctly, and that is absolutely fair game. But if you notice, a lot of people condemn leaders of other countries, Putin, uh, 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 Kim in North Korea, uh, all around the country, all around the world, except in Israel, it's the country that is often condemned. That's troublesome to me, and that's where I link anti-Semitism to the condemnation of Israel rather than its leaders. And by the way, we had a president recently, too, who drew the ire of many of us. It was he that drew the ire, not the United States of America. There is a difference. And I want to point out that connection. Uh, looking for a little bit more empathy, understanding, and most importantly, Stephanie, Stephanie, an understanding of history, including 20th century history. Let's go more broader in terms of policy and influence in politics and really across the Democratic Party. 
We know that there are an awful lot of Americans across the country that are moderate, moderate Democrats, moderate Republicans. Earlier this week, I was asking Jake Sherman uh, from Punchbowl News about the infrastructure deal, about why we don't hear more from moderate Democrats. Are they behind all of the spending initiatives? And he said, you're not going to hear from them. They're wimps. Huh. Well, uh, Jake loves to throw that at us, and frankly, it inspires us a little bit more. But Stephanie, this is, you, you, went, you, asked, you asked me a question earlier about how our country responds to condemnation so much more than cooperation. You know, the work of my colleagues on the Problem Solvers Caucus, the moderates on both sides of the aisle, you know, we're workhorses, we're not show horses. You know, we don't raise our hands to be on TV every single night. We don't have massive social media platforms. We're actually doing the work behind the scenes, but, meeting with one another, trying to find bridges to cooperation. Dean, so this is nonsense to say that somehow it's a failure. But Congressman, what does that work get you in terms of policy? Ultimately, Stephanie, if the United States of America and American voters believe that the path to prosperity and peace and security uh, is through two sides further retreating to corners, throwing political firebombs at one another, uh, and a fringe on each side uh, essentially being the voices of the entire uh, Republican and Democratic Party, if that's what America wants, well, we're getting that right now. Uh, I would ask and I would implore and I would invite people who are watching right now to take a breath uh, and really reflect on where we want to go uh, and what types of dispositions we want to see in our United States Congress and state houses around the country. I'm not condemning my own party. I'm not condemning the Republican Party, but I'm encouraging thoughtful, like-minded Americans, no matter your politics, to recognize that we have got to start breaking bread together uh, before we destroy Americans' comprehensive faith in government. I'm trying to do that work quietly and the way that I was taught to do it uh, in a manner that I think is becoming of a member of Congress. That is not how many of my colleagues act. I'm trying to encourage a little bit of a change of behavior. And I think that is the path to better policy. Time will tell.